Welcome to The Artist Politic. Today we talk with Gabriel Teodros at Vermilion Art Gallery in the heart of Capitol Hill. He is a prolific hip-hop artist and storyteller, known for taking on social, political, and personal topics in his work. We talk about the line between artist and activist, the importance of community, and the rituals of healing. to the show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. So now I've been aware of you for a long time. Of course, you've been on the Seattle, scene, Seattle music scene for, let's say, forever. No, not forever. <laughs> yeah, for, Just 20 years. <laughs> Just 20 years, right. <laughs> so, so long music scene before that. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, so of course, I think of you as, you know, a skilled and gifted MC, hip hop artist. Thank you. Um, but I also think of you in equal measure, an activist and uh, maybe a community organizer. Um, are you comfortable with those, I wouldn't those put, kinds of labels? I wouldn't put it on myself. No. Um, no, just because there's so many community organizers that I know that do such great work that are like in the front line, so to say, so many ways. There's people that sh are showing up and organizing rallies on a regular basis mm -hmm. there's people that are doing free legal work there's people that you know that like and i know these people and there's no way for me to say that like that i do that same level of organizing yeah hey, what about it, the activist role do you consider the music that you make no partly being an activist no not really hmm. um i feel like i feel like at best i feel like at best my music can amplify um, the struggles of people going through it and can amplify um, the work being done in community. And it's done well when I'm in good communication with people that are doing that work. Mm. But I don't think any of us as musicians or artists can call ourselves activists or organizers without engaging in real organizing work. I think it's, I think it's, it, it, sometimes it might look like a thin line, but it's a definite line. Yeah. I really, I don't know if you watched Not Your Negro, the film about um, James Baldwin's last body of work. I did not see that. It's a brilliant film. Yeah. And there was, one, there was one piece that I loved where um, James Baldwin talked about himself as, a, how did he say it? There's a thin line between the actor and the witness, mm. the actor in social change and the witness of it. Yeah. Um, and he felt very squarely like he's a witness. Oh. And the witness has an important role in the movement. I identify with that. I feel like a witness more than an actor, an activist, or a community organizer. I see. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. That, you know, preparing these questions, I, I didn't expect that answer. Oh, <laughs> and, yeah. and I appreciate that answer because it, yeah. clarifies, it clarifies things for me, um, you know, being an artist myself and and working with all sorts of artists and mm -hmm. and where that that line is and yeah I, you're I, right i mean i feel engaged in certain fights you know uh -huh. but i feel and 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 those fights are important but i feel like i'm engaged in a fight of stories right and a lot of times that's when you win or lose a fight of stories it's like so much can get lost you know mm -hmm. what i mean mm -hmm. um entire groups of people can be, segments of society can be vilified. And when they're vilified, um, uh, laws can get passed mm -hmm. that affect these people's lives. They can get written out of society, out of neighborhoods, out of cities, out of their homes. And these kind of things happen. So I think it's really important for us as storytellers to realize that we do have an important role in movements. I just, I just think it's a thin line between like artists and an activist organizer. Like it's, yeah. They're different roles and I'm not trying to I'm not trying to diminish my role as an artist because I do right. think it's important, but I think it's important for everyone to know their lane. A lot of times I see artists um, take up a lot of airspace on television and in interviews, speaking up for movements that they're not actually engaged in mm. because people um, will just elevate somebody who's an artist because they have because they talk about something in their songs 
as an authority on a subject when there's actual people that are doing real work yes. that can tell the story 10 times better or can actually tell the real story because they're engaged in the work, you know? Right. And yeah, I never, I never want to be one of those people that's taking up airspace to talk about a struggle that I'm not actively engaged in, mm. if that makes sense. It you does know? make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I think nowadays, you know, mm-hmm. that that kind of mindset affects all of us. Anybody with an Instagram account yeah. is all of a sudden up against that mm-hmm. that line that you're talking about. And mm-hmm. you know, everyone's this, an expert. You right. Know, you really and don't this know. Feeling of mm-hmm. like social media activism, right? I mm-hmm. I retweeted it so I care about it. Um, mm-hmm. not it's not enough, right? You gotta, yeah. you gotta actually engage. Yeah. So are there any areas where you you are hands on, you are engaged? Yeah. Um, again, for me, it 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 always comes back to to storytellers, to raising the next generation of storytellers, uh, to preserving authenticity in the craft, to preserving history mm-hmm. um, as a whole for people that don't really get their stories told unless we tell it. Yeah. Um, so the places that I'm hands on have to do more with teaching, mm. um, more with you know working with younger artists, giving them a space to record, to create, to write. To uh, <laughs> I, sometimes I hesitate to use the word mentoring, but mentoring or yeah. big, big, being the big homie yeah, that I fair. never that I never had to younger artists that are yeah. coming up. Um, yeah. yeah, organizing events, things like that. Um, but it's all very much centered around art, you know. Right. Um, I will say though that just in terms of like being of service to movements that I care deeply about, um, I don't know if you follow Grace Lee Boggs. I don't. Grace Lee Boggs is one of my favorite thinkers um, in history. She just passed away a few years ago at the at the, the age of ninety nine. Wow. Um, she wrote a couple of books that were hugely influential um, in this God, what decade even. 60s, 70s, mm. 80s. She's a huge influence on so many of us. Um, and she said that for so long, we thought that change happens through mass movements, but critical c- connections are actually as important as mass movements, sometimes more so. Mm. So I think that for change to happen, we have to have critical connections, right? Um, And I try to keep my critical connections with organizers who are doing work good all the time. And I hope that my work is informed by them. Sometimes I stray, I'm not perfect, nobody is. Um, But that's another way that I feel like I'm hands-on. Critical connection going both ways, Mm -hmm. you know, like. Let's dive into, let's dive into a little bit, a little bit of childhood background. Um, Basing this off of um, your song, East Africa. Uh Um, and in that song, you talk about about growing up. Uh, your mother's Ethiopian, mm-hmm. and you talk about sort of distancing yourself from from that culture. From in the song, you talk about distancing, distancing yourself from her language as right? a child. As a child. As yeah, a child. As a little kid. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to know more about that. How how did you feel about that? How old were you when you were having those kinds of yeah. thoughts? Well, it's a really common experience, I would say, for immigrant people in right. general. Um, it, in the song, I talk about going to school. I'm talking about early, like kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Mm-hmm. First going to school as a little kid, having an accent, mm-hmm. being teased because you had an accent, mm-hmm. and then going home and deciding to only speak English to your family. Yeah. This is a very common story, right. by the way. It's not like unique to me yeah. by any means. Right. So it was that. And my mom actually kind of like feeling me and you know, at that age she she just started speaking English to me. Oh she did. Yeah. yeah. So and she wasn't resistant to No. Yeah. Oh. No. She she kinda got it. Yeah. Um so my first language in life was Amharic. By the time I'm seven, eight years old, I only know a few words. Mm. You know, and now in my 30s, I'm trying to relearn the language. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you that, like, if you... Because when I did Love Work, I hadn't been to Ethiopia yet. Like, so much uh-huh. has changed since uh, writing Love Work, you know? Well, sure. So that was, that was 2007. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We're, in, we're in 2019 now. So yeah. 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 I can't yeah. believe it's been that long since that record's been out. I know. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's what it was about. It was about early childhood. Yeah. 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 So, do you... Well, 
Mm-hmm. Regret is a strong word, but totally. I regret. Do, do you I, I regret? Yeah, uh, losing Amharic. Yeah, it's one yeah. of the biggest regrets that I have yeah. for sure. Like I wish I held on to the culture. I wish. Uh, I wish peer pressure and bullying didn't have such a profound effect on me when I was first and second grade. Sure. Uh, yeah. This is kind of deep, but I realized some years ago, there's some musicians that we all know that I was in school with in the first, second grade. And I'm at a rehearsal. Um, this is around the love work time too. Uh, Aaron Walker Loud from Big World Breaks. He was uh, drumming for, uh, for these shows. And he brings up this memory and he's talking about stuff that happened in the first and second grade. And he's like, do you remember that? We were in class together. And I looked at him and I said, what? Hmm. And I started thinking about it. I have all these clear memories of kindergarten, but when it comes to the first and second grade of my life, I can't remember anything. Like it's, it's blocked out of my memory. Yeah. There's like a few little like random flashes of stuff. Like I kind of remember my grandmother coming at that time period. I remember fights and I remember bullying, but I think it was so harsh that I just blocked it out of my memory. Yeah, you think so? Huh? I, didn't, I didn't remember that Aaron was in a class with me. I don't remember what my teachers looked like. I don't remember any of it. Huh. First, second, and third grade, I don't really remember. By the time I hit fourth grade, I went to a different school and I started remembering stuff. So it's, yeah, it's a trip. Yeah, yeah. interesting. How, how much do you think you or just we as people hang on to I guess you'd call it trauma like yeah. that. How do you think you've carried that forward into your adult life? Probably, probably. Um, my, my, my latest album, um, South and Healing Ritual, is all about that. It's about healing from trauma. And, you know, I wrote that album particularly um, about the trauma of, uh, of an intimate relationship that, that I was in that went south, you know. Um, but in writing that album, and talking about things that I was scared of talking about in music and sometimes just even in like everyday conversation, I realized that the trauma is much deeper than that relationship. So mm. I had to like face a lot of like deeper things that, you know, go back to early childhood on yeah. that record, you know? So maybe for, for the people that are watching that aren't from the Northwest, okay, um, can you paint a picture of what the South End means to Seattle? Yeah, um, South End is the community where I grew up, it's the community where my parents met each other where I was born, um, where I still live right now. Um, so Seattle is, I think, what did the U.S. Census say? We're, we are the fifth whitest major city mm. in the United States. I think that's what it was. It's up there. It's a very white city. Yes, sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. and we have uh, just a few communities and neighborhoods that have historically been mostly people of color. Uh, in the time that I was growing up, um, Seattle, because I think Seattle is, is also designated a sanctuary city. Is that the official title? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, the South End is a, is, is a neighborhood that historically has had black folks. Um, but as we were growing up, uh, there's two huge low income housing projects, uh, Rainier Vista and Holly Park. Mm-hmm. Um, and then right on McClellan, there's this whole row of houses that um, they're basically like sanctuary houses. So one year growing up, this entire block was just filled with Cambodian families mm-hmm. that had just been flown in. Mm. One time, one year it was like all Eritrean families. One year it was all Somali families, yeah. all Ethiopian families, all, you know? Yeah. There's a huge Filipino uh, population in the South End, um, Samoan, like all these different cultures, Vietnamese, um, Mexican, Colombian, like all these folks from all the different parts of the world pretty much have come to Seattle and the South End is a place that they made home. And I grew up, and a lot of us grew up in that kind of like patchwork, like mm-hmm. of identities. Like, you know, you on, on your block, there might be like 10 houses and in each house, everybody's grandma speaks a different language. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. when you go to school or you go to the basketball court, everyone speaks a common language and hip hop seems to be one of the, one of the unifiers, yeah. you know? Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of what the South End is. That's, that's the, the neighborhood that raised us. It feels really unique. Like when we go to other cities and there'll be like a whole group of us like walking down the street in New York or something or in a pla- places that are more segregated, mm-hmm. people would be like, how are y'all all friends mm-hmm. or how do you know each other? You know, there's artists that have come visited us from Detroit or Pontiac, Michigan. And, 
we go to like my neighbor Daps' house and they're saying like, wow, this is the first time I've ever had a holiday with Asian people. And like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just yeah. like things that are so basic to us yeah. because the South End is the way it is seem weird to <laughs> people in other places, you know? Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, that's just like a fraction of what the South End is, you know? Right. Yeah. But it's changing and it's changing really fast. Yeah. Yeah. Are you resistant to that change? Well, of course I am. Yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I like I like having a community, you know, and I like having um, history in a community and yeah. being allowed to have history in a community and, and being allowed to like, not being allowed, but being able to uh, be in a place and have and imagine a future legacy in a place where I'm working, mm. you know, in a place where, you know, where you know your neighbors and you've known your neighbors for generations, like that kind of thing right. that almost feels like, it doesn't feel like a reality, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hmm. and it, it, it feels like a privilege, you know what I mean? And I don't know why that has to be such a privilege, you know? Hmm. Yeah. And it's cold because like the South End is cold blooded because the South End is, a majority of it is made up by displaced people. Hmm. And here we are being displaced again. Right. You know, and again, it's like, when will it, when will we ever be able to find home or what is home? Yeah. You know, the South then makes me think of what is home mm-hmm. as a question, you know? Yeah. Ready for the lightning round? Sure. Oh. If you could see one lesser known Seattle rap artist make a huge comeback this year, who would it be? Kings is my favorite rapper in all Seattle history. Uh, yeah, I, I hope, I hope more people realize his brilliance and how prolific he is. This year and all years to come. Yes. You know? So, yeah. Question, next question. How many retweets do we have to get to convince you guys to make a new record? Uh, not many. Not many. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're like, we're like quietly working together all the time. Like, he's on the album, you know? Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. We're going to hold you, we're going to hold you guys to that. Yeah. Who's yeah. the least helpful of the X Men? The least, oh, that's a great question. Hmm. The least helpful of the X-Men. You know, Cyclops always like got on my nerves. <laughs> he's just an annoying character to me, but I don't know if he's that, if he's not helpful. He might be the least helpful. I'm gonna go with Cyclops just because I never liked him. Okay. But I don't think that's the right answer, but I'm gonna go with it. There's no right answer, no right answer. No, I think there's a right answer to this. <laughs> yeah, well, and I'm I sure. don't I don't think it's Cyclops because uh-huh. he can like really blow shit up with his eyes. Mm. But he just got on my nerves, so I'm gonna okay. go with him. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you've been traveling a lot recently. Do you have any travel life hacks? Air travel specifically? Uh, roll roll your clothes when you pack them. You'll fit more. You'll fit more clothes mm. in your bag if you roll it as opposed to folding it. That actually works because I've heard that, but I've yeah. never done it. Oh yeah, it totally works. Okay. Yeah, shout out to Tony Hill. She told me that way back in the day. Yeah. And uh, it's it's you know I've helped people pack since then. So. What's the bravest <laughs> song ever recorded? The bravest song ever recorded. Damn, that's a hard question. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. That's a hard question. Yeah, you know, it's not fair for me to ask a question like that and not have an answer of my own ready. Wow, I like that question. I'm going to come back to that. I don't have an answer right now. I'm going to give you my answer that just popped in my head. Yeah. How about Strange Fruit? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of want I don't know if it's the bravest, but it's got to be up there. It's got to be up there. I kind of want to roll with that. Mm. Yeah. Like anything from that time period. Yeah. Especially like black women making that kind of art in a time period when, you know, when lynchings are actually happening. Yeah, And right? you're singing about, lyn- yeah. From our perspective that, you know, we can, mm-hmm. we can Missi- feel Missi- that time. Miss- Mississippi goddamn's got to be up there. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, there's probably a lot. There's um, mm-hmm. there's a black queer woman artist that I was listening to recently from that time period, and I feel like her mm-hmm. whole discography is brave as hell. Huh. Um, What's the most liberating part of DJing at KXP? That's great. It's a great question. Um, just being able to play whatever you want. Yeah, right. Yeah, like I have... 
Because you're on at what, what time period are you on? My, re- my regular hours are 1 a.m. to 6 a.m., which yeah. means the FCC is yeah. not really tripping. So you on, can on the, literally on play whatever, words. yeah. Yeah. But, you know, when they hired me, they said, like, we're hiring you for your ear. Mm-hmm. We want you to play what you like. And if you ever start playing a song that you don't like, but it happens to be in our heavy rotation, it doesn't matter if it's in rotation. If you don't like it, take it off while it's on the air. So hearing that is like, yeah, it's just the whole thing is liberating, you know? One last lightning round. Mm -hmm. What's the best coffee in Seattle? That's another hard question. That's a political question. (laughs) (laughs) That is the most political question (laughs) you've asked. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I'm going to go with a four-part answer. <laughs> yep, yep. It's Cafe of All. This is not one, two, three, by the way. Okay. This is Cafe of All, Hood Famous, and The Station. I'm, I'm rolling that. Okay, solid. Oh, wait, and Cafe Red. Cafe what? Red. Where's that? It's on MLK and Othello. Oh, yeah. okay. People should go to all four. Okay. All four of those, and, and, and you tell me what's your favorite and then coffee. We'll, yeah, we'll rank them. Yep. Okay, yep. we'll do it. Yeah, so I'm, you know, not just because this is your current newest album, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just personally interested in the concept of healing yeah. and trauma mm-hmm. and um, the process involved in sorting all that out that, you know, mm-hmm. each of us has, has our own stories. We all have right? our own traumas. It's so true. Um, and... You know, and in my life, I try and figure out how to how to address those traumas and how to heal yeah. from them, and and try different angles of healing. You know, different yeah. different ways to attack it. Yeah. Um, how, aside from making your art, which is mm-hmm. clearly an outlet for your healing, mm-hmm. um, what else do you do? What other tools do you have in, in the in the tool bag? I really feel like talking about things in community and talking about things with your loved ones is or just people you trust, or even a support group. Mm-hmm. Um, I, don't, I don't have an official support group, but I, I feel like yeah. I do have a support group with my friends, um, is the most valuable thing. You know, uh, People that can hold you accountable and love you at the same time, mm-hmm. um, that's it, man. And as I was reading Body Keeps a Score and other things that I've read about um, dealing with trauma, the one thing that they say over and over again is like, don't go through it alone. Mm-hmm. You can't fix this. You can't fix this in isolation. And most therapy, most therapy, is about groups. Mm-hmm. You know, whether you right. whether you're talking one on one with the therapist, mm-hmm. or you're in a support group, it's all it's always about talking about it with other people. Yeah, you know, connecting, what I mean? connecting. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder why it is that when when we are in our darkest moments, when we're mm-hmm. dealing with depression, anxiety, and trauma, mm-hmm. I wonder why it's so many of us, our default position is to separate ourselves from other people, right? Yeah. Isolation is like the first, we go it's the first reaction, right? Mm-hmm. But it's, it's not what we need. So why, yeah. why is that built in? There's probably so many reasons. Like, you, you know, when somebody, especially like, like if you're harmed in a relationship or you're harmed by someone that you love or, you know, or it could be a family member or whatever it is. Um, like it's, it's an actual trauma that happens to you. It, it's, it's, it's damaged your ability to trust, mm-hmm. right? And just like, just like, I make a lot of analogies like with mental health, like the way, how would you treat a broken bone? Mm-hmm. Or how would you treat like a sore muscle or, or whenever, the, when, these things happen to your to your body, right? Like you, you know, the way we, for some reason, the way we deal with mental health is completely different. Yeah. And we don't think about things like, I think about trust as a muscle, Yeah. you know? And if you don't use a muscle in your body, that shit becomes weak and could right. fall off. Like you, <laughs> right. you might have to like amputate a limb. Like if you just like never, if I just never move my arm ever, <laughs> You know what I mean? It'd be, it'd be pretty impossible. But if I never moved my arm ever, like at one point they're going to have to cut my arm off. Right. But we, for some reason, we don't think of things like trust the same way. Mm. I feel like to rebuild your ability to trust other people, 
You have to act on it. You have to take leaps of faith. You have to, you know, and you can take baby steps. It's okay. Like, like, just, like just like when you're going through physical therapy from a physical trauma, mm-hmm. you don't immediately go to like lifting weights. You <laughs> right. know what I mean? Like you, you've seen people when they're recovering from things like therapy takes a long time and you've got to take baby steps right. to, rebuild tr- to, to, to rebuild a muscle again. And I, and I feel like rebuilding trust is the exact same way. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah t- t- taking those baby steps, doing a little bit every day. Um, one of my favorite verses on the album is, uh, is thankful you're still here. Cause the second verse, I just, it starts out so silly where I'm just talking about like, I wake up, take a shower, brush my teeth, and then I go get some coffee. And the morning routine is not about the caffeine, but it's just about seeing other people. That sounds mm-hmm. so simple and it's like a really like goofy way to start a verse, but it is the realest thing that I said on that whole album because yeah. that little walk for me to get out of the house and see other human beings has kept me alive. Yeah. Like that little walk to get out of the house is the thing that kept me out of depression. It got me away from suicide. It, you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. I got to see other people, yeah. you know, and, it, and that changed my whole day. And then I was yeah. able to function in a better way, you know? So. Yeah. That resonates with me a lot. Yeah. Um, Having to practice helps, man. Yeah. I, I'm going to remember that one. I need to incorporate a little bit more of that in yeah. my life. And see, and because we're getting older, and, and Seattle is the way it is, and the, the way like humanity and technology is evolving, and we're becoming more of a society that just like mm-hmm. looks at this, we're not connecting, and it's like I feel like we have to work twice as hard, three times as hard, just to like, just to be people. Yeah. You know, just to just to not isolate ourselves. Like we have to do work to not isolate ourselves. Yeah. And that that work is part of our mental health. It's part of our mental well-being. It's as important or more important than going to the gym is for you. You know what I mean? Or whatever it, yeah. whatever you may do to to keep your body intact. Like you right. yeah, without this you don't have anything. Yeah. You know? I do want to ask you about I want to ask you about the album cover. Mm. Um you for you're, history? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um <laughs> you're wearing a sweatshirt on oh, the yeah. cover. Yeah. Uh that says I am my ancestors wildest dreams. Yeah. Uh, clearly a choice to put that on yeah, the cover. Yeah. Um, what does that phrase mean to you? Um, well, first of all, it's, uh, it's by an artist named uh, B. Mike, who makes those shirts, mm. and it's kind of iconic. It's, it's, a, it's a really popular shirt. Uh, he's a muralist based in New Orleans. Uh, he's got an incredible like, warehouse mm. um, out there, um, and I bought it at that warehouse. Mm. I first saw this shirt in a painting that he did I was like, wow, that, yeah. that just says it all. You it's know? such a striking phrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's 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 a concept that's not new to me either. It's like it's something that I talked about on Color People's Time Machine. Um, it's something that I think about with all my science fiction work. Um, and it is that when I think about that phrase, it's like, you know, there's so many things in our lives that we're facing that seem insurmountable. They seem impossible. But at one point in time, black people not being in slavery seemed impossible, Mm -hmm. you know? But there was people like Harriet Tubman and there was people who dared to survive, that dared to fight back, that dared to, you know, make runaways to freedom that they they were imagining a future where black people didn't have to live in bondage, you know? And I think that phrase specifically points to African-American people's experience, but it's something that resonates with me and resonates with so many people, like our entire reality, the things that we're living, all these things that shouldn't even be here, somebody dreamed way back then, you know? And if we dream as far as we can, even though it seems impossible, we can make that reality happen, you know? So that's something that I think about in everything that I do, you know? Like we're part of a large continuum of people that dared to dream and imagine a world that didn't seem possible and they made it exist, you know? So, yeah, that's, to me, that's what that phrase makes me think of. What's the most important and effective thing that, that we can do to, you know, preserve our communities mm. and push, push this crazy world into mm. a positive direction in, in the little way that each of us can? Take what you know and teach it. 
to somebody younger than you. Um, something my big homie Issei said when I was real young. He said, you have something to offer these youth. You should be teaching it, you know? Um, so that's one thing. Build community everywhere you can, in every way you can. Um, and keep learning, keep growing, never stop evolving, you know? Education doesn't start or end inside of school. Um, yeah, those are a few things. That's great. Yeah. Gabriel Teodros, thanks for thank having you me. for stopping by. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, sir.